Hello, welcome everybody. I believe I am now able to speak. I believe you might be able to see me as well. Just in case you wonder, this is Schrodinger behind myself because I'm teaching quantum physics and the white screen is, um, is a bit boring. So I like to have this, uh, this support from behind. So this is our second IOP lecture from the year, already the eighth, I believe, from the series for this uh, academic year. And tonight is our great pleasure and privilege to welcome Dr. Nina Voronova from the Moscow uh, Engineering Institute of Physics, where she graduated in 2006. And then uh, she did her PhD in, uh, she obtained her PhD in 2012 under the supervision, if I'm not mistaken, of a very prestigious, uh, famous and uh, renowned scientist, Professor Yuri Lozovic, who is working on condensate, mesoscopic physics, uh, superfluid, these kind of things. And this is the topic for which uh, Nina is most famous, probably. She's working on vortices herself in uh, various uh, systems, in particular microcavity polaritons. Um, and she's very famous in particular for her discovery or proposal of the so-called capita pendulum. So pendulum, it's in relation with the topic of tonight. But uh, unfortunately, we will not hear about the capita pendulum because we insisted very much that uh, Nina gives a non-technical non-research um, uh, introduction or overview of the topics of Pandula, so as to benefit uh, our wide audience uh, and, uh, and our students. So the academic achievements uh, of Nina are too many and important to mention. I'd like to, uh, to say as well that uh, beyond physics, she's also someone who's very interesting because she's a professional photographer of what is heavy metal music. Right? So you wouldn't maybe expect this when you uh, listen to her um, tell you about, uh, about pandula oscillations and this kind of things. You, some other people, so there is a different class of people than ourselves who uh, also know Nina from being uh, backstage and taking pictures of these people in the smokes on the, on the, on the patient of this uh, type of music. Okay, all this being said, as you know, we encourage very much people to ask questions. So do so please in the box you've got uh, at the bottom. As we said, it's non-technical, so be creative in what you want to ask Nina regarding Pandula if possible. And uh, we'll carry uh, the discussion at the end of her lecture. Nina, if you want to unmute yourself and take the stage, it is all yours for all the time that you will need it. Thank you very much, Fabrice. Now that everyone announced about Capizza Pendula, maybe I have to talk about that too. But uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I will now try to share the screen. Do you see my screen? Yes. Uh, thank you, Fabrice. So uh, this is a talk, which is, uh, as you, you see, named very generally the Pendola universe. And the aim is to uh, just show that the pendulum, which we are really, really familiar with, like a swing in a playground, actually mathematically is described by some equations which appear in every different situations in life. So, and we know in physics that if the mathematical equation is the same, then the, the behavior should be also the same, regardless of uh, what kind of variables you have in a system, what is changing, if the equation is the same, the solution is also the same. But uh, I will keep it really very basic and I would like to start uh, with some history. So here you see the, the, the photograph of a pendulum, which is uh, at the moment, I think is the most ancient pendulum, which is still like working since 11th century when it was uh, established in the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela in Spain. So this is the device uh, which is set into motion by monks uh, for some holy services. And uh, it is swinging back and forth like what we call now a pendulum. And it was uh, there since centuries. I think the version which is operating now is there since the 16th century and uh, this uh, originally was uh, established there in the 11th century. But even before that, even in the ancient times, there is evidence that pendulums were used in ancient Egypt and in Rome as some healthcare 
devices to say that the practitioners of med medicine would use a dowsing pendulum for making diagnosis and determining the best treatment, which now so sounds for us completely unscientific. So they would uh, uh, take, um, I don't know if you see the video of me, because I don't see myself, and if they take a pendulum and uh, just uh, walk with it around the patient body and uh, it will show where it hurts and then they will go to check the best treatment. So believing actually that it will point at a better solution as a medicine. Yeah. So it would point for a location of infection and at the same time it will point at a remedy. And then also, of course, Still in the ancient times, these uh, pendulums were used as uh, div for divining, yeah, for divine uh, uh, fate. Yes, so healers, psychics, they used uh, it to locate any answer to a question. So people were probably mesmerized by the motion, by the swinging motion of this, because it is kind of hypnotizing, yes, and. Uh, uh, people used pen pendulum over the map to search for gold. People used them to find directions, uh, oil, minerals, even to locate people. I think uh, maybe there are some uh, people now who even nowadays believe that it can work. But uh, what developed as, as a physical description of this uh, device happened with Galileo in end of 16th, beginning of 17th century, when he completely disregarded Aristotelian uh, um, approach to physics. What it means is that Aristotle would see a pendulum as an example of constrained motion. A heavy body in Aristotelian physics always seeks to move from higher position to a lower one. So for Aristotle, the pendulum was just something very natural, going from up to down. However, of course, when it goes up again, it kind of goes against. So Galileo would see a pendulum, not like a falling, falling body, but like an oscillator, which repeats its motion over and over again, if there is no friction. Yeah. So this uh, approach to a pendulum as an oscillator was the seed, the most productive seed and mathematical framework in physics. And uh, this framework has been since applied in mechanics and electromagnetism and quantum physics. And th this idea was so successful that uh, uh, it had to remove the Aristotelian approach to physics at that time. So what is a pendulum? Pendulum is a, any weight, basically any mass, any concentrated matter attached to a chain or a string or a rod that can swing from side to side in some constant motion. So as long as uh, the angle of deflection from the normal of this pendulum is small, it will keep uh, the same period, same amplitude, and this is what actually Galileo was mesmerized with. So he uh, realized that the time that it takes for a pendulum to swing back and forth remains constant. But what is very curious is that at that time, there was no good clock to measure time. So how he could actually understand that the time that it takes for it to swing back and forth is the same all the time. The same means regardless of the amplitude. So if the amplitude is small, the amplitude is a bit bigger, a, a bit more bigger, so the period stays the same. What he did actually, he used his heartbeat to measure the time, to measure the period of the pendulum, he counted his own heartbeat. And even using this not very accurate time measuring devices, uh, his pulse basically, he could establish the famous uh, property of isochronism, which isochronous uh, pendula, is the pendulum which takes the same time to go uh, back and forth regardless of the amplitude. So a little bit later, maybe 50 years later, Christian Huygens built the first clock with this pendulum. So he realized that uh, to make the oscillation more regular, he needs to make it as, uh, uh, not rotate in the vertical plane, but to make a cycloid arc. 
and modern watches are working on this principle. Basically, all the clocks until middle of 20th century worked on pendulums. So Galileo used the pendulum to conduct these measurements on effects of gravity. He observed that the reason for the pendulum to move back and forth toward the resting position, then up again and back again, is because of the gravity force which pulls the mass downwards. And this was the early experiment and uh, basically it allowed uh, all the scientists at that time to calculate the shape of Earth. And then still 200 years later, it was used to prove that the Earth spins. But before I go to spinning of the Earth, so this is the wrong uh, sequence of slides, uh, let's discuss the basic key features of a pendulum. So imagine that uh, I am a timekeeper in a tower with a pendulum clock. And I observe that each day it clocks goes a little bit wrong. By a minute or two per day, it goes uh, incorrect uh, and erroneous. So what I need to keep in mind is that this period of swinging, as Galileo found out, depends only on the length of this, pe of this pendulum, not on, on the mass, but only on the length, not on the amplitude. So if we draw this simple picture, our basic ideas that we need, basic notions are mass, which is already drawn here, the forces that act on this bob in the end, so the gravity force, the tension force. So as you see, if we add these two vectors in a parallelogram rule, we will get a restoring force, which forces the bob to go towards the equilibrium point. Then the amplitude is how far is actually it uh, goes up, left or right. And then the period, which depends, and I said already, on the length of the of this pendulum. So we see here now first variable coming in in our talk, in my talk, is this angle phi. And the equilibrium position is this phi equal to zero. And pi is the natural constraint on top here. So we see here that the period of this pendulum depends only on, on uh, the length. So if we want to change a little bit to correct the clock and the tower, what we need is to change the length of this rod here inside. And the actual shape of our time dependence of the angle here given for small angles depends on the initial conditions. So, so what we can do is we can have a pendulum looking in the equilibrium position and hit it like this, then we will have a sine function as one uh, in the previous slide and as the law is written here. Or we can actually move it to the right and let it go without any speed and then we will get a cosine function instead. Okay, so as I said, after this Galileo discovery, 200 years passes and then this pendulum was used to prove that Earth spins. Actually, scientists had, po had postulated that the Earth is spinning around uh, for thousands of years since uh, Bruno, probably. So, but until 19th century, which is 200 years after Galileo began his experiments, another scientist called Leon Foucault was able to prove that the Earth spins. So what I will do is I will show you a little experiment here. I don't know if you see my video very well. So thing is that the Earth, our Earth, since it rotates, is not an inertial system because it is going around its axis. So the plane of oscillation of the pendulum, let me see myself at least. Uh, Fabrice, can you assist me? Can you tell me please if you can see yes. the... <clears throat> now we uh, see the, if you get it closer to you, we'll see everything. Yeah, now we see the pendulum. Like this? Yeah. Okay, so he made, uh, Leon Foucault made a very famous experiment in 1851 in Paris under the dome of Pantheon. So he had a 30 kilogram copper bob, copper sphere, and it was tied to a steel cable, which was almost 70 meters long. And he demonstrated that uh, the, um, trajectory of 
of this ball was not lying in one plane. So I will try to reproduce this. I don't have a 70 meter uh, cord, of course, but you see that the plane in which the pendulum oscillates is rotating. So in Foucault's experiment, actually he demonstrated that the Earth is rotating around some fixed star, which is our sun, and uh, the plane of oscillations completely rotated in 32 hours in that experiment. And then uh, it was later confirmed. Okay, so uh, what happens with uh, Foucault pendulum is that because this, the Earth rotates, if we start to swing our pendulum directly in the pole here at the North Pole, it will just go back and forth and nothing else happens. But if we go, uh, no, that's not true. If we do it on the equator, then nothing else happens. But if we do it on the North Pole, it will actually go and change its um, plane of rotation, plane of, in which the trajectory lies, it will change the plane completely come back to itself in 24 hours. But if we do it somewhere in between, like here, in uh, he did it in Paris, it was then 32 hours. So the period was different of this change of the oscillation plane. Okay. Let's go further. So this is the list, the very first list of uh, the mechanical examples when we can see the uh, use of the pendulum. It is pendulum clock invented by Huygens. Huygens was actually in a very <laughs> diverse person. He was an astronomer and he was looking also into finding better way to define longitude in uh, marine ships and on, in, on the sea. And what actually happened to Huygens once is that he was lying sick in bed and he had this kind of pendulum clocks on the wall and he, he was just lo looking at these clocks and he saw that after some time, they were synchronized. So they started to move in a synchronous manner, but in anti-phase. And he was uh, very much surprised by what he saw. And then uh, he actually found the explanation that uh, they start to synchronize or desynchronize, or even they can kill each other's oscillations because of the, some motion which is coming from the wall uh, on which both clock hang. Okay, so. Foucault pendulum I have just shown you. Wrecking ball, which is used to demolish buildings, uh, is another example of pendulum motion. A very uh, skilled crane operator can uh, just swing it and uh, demolish any house. And uh, energy which would be stored in this upswinging will be all released when it hits the building. Then bowling, when you play regular bowling in a club, you use your arm as a cord, as a rod for the pendulum. So you use the energy of your arm and uh, transfer it to the spin of the ball. Ballistic pendulum is uh, used uh, usually by police department for many years to understand how hard the bullet hits, actually. So we, there is a wooden rod, I don't know if you see me, so the wooden rod in which you shoot a bullet and then it starts to rotate, and by the angle it rotates, you can understand uh, some bullet properties. Metronomes are used for, actually, I don't know why I'm not showing you more pictures. This is a swing in the, in the playground. Metronomes are used in uh, music, uh, basically, to check the rhythm of your music. So they have uh, also some mass attached to a swinging rod, and the, the length from the point of the fixed point to the mass defines the period of this oscillation. Flapping of wings of birds and insects, of course, is also an example of pendulum motion. Any kind of musical instrument, it can be cello, guitar, harp, would be also in a periodic oscillatory motion. This is the, the kid's toy. And these are just a few mechanical examples, not even going to another branches of physics, in where you see all the same behavior actually, and it is the same because it is described by the same equation. So now here, I would like to compare the pendulum, which is the main uh, object of my talk 
with another object which is described by harmonic oscillation equation and uh, actually understand why the pendulum is so much richer and why the pendulum actually enters like the pendulum equation enters in so many different problems in science not only physics it can be biology it can be electricity it can be quantum physics but why are we talking just about pendulum and not for example a mass attached to a spring because from the first sight it seems that it is the same so here we have also a restoring force acting on a string on a spring here which is proportional to to the coordinate and the potential energy is uh, if the oscillation is small is defined by the square of this coordinate so if i plot it very basically here it is parabolic of course if we start to make the displacement higher and higher it will become less and less parabolic until uh, spring breaks but uh, what happens at any energy you have a constrained motion you have a periodic motion uh, from one turning point to the other turning point but why the pendulum is different so if we plot the potential energy in this case we see that it is defined by the height it doesn't matter if we define the zero earth is in the bottom point or in the fixed point here it's written for bottom point you will see that actually the potential energy is defined by the cosine the cosine of our coordinate and the cosine of course is approximated by a parabola only when the angle is small and if we compare the situations we can see that here it is the same as for the previous case here it is already a little bit different and here you can see that if you increase the energy if you either make the displacement very large or you give it too much velocity in the beginning so that the energy is so high that it exceeds the maximum of the potential energy you can get in some completely different regimes yeah so in the <laughs> advertised capizza pendulum you can even get this in this situation to have a little let me see if i can have a pointer so of course our oscillations are around the minimum yes this is called a stable equilibrium point but if we go up here this is another equilibrium point corresponding to phi equal to pi but this is unstable so a body can't stay here it, if if it has any velocity any displacement it will fall down here or here but if you start to change your system a little bit for example if you start to oscillate the suspension point back and forth up and down then the potential starts to change and you can have an extra minimum here on top and then you will even have the upper side stabilizing so your pendulum instead of oscillating around the zero will be oscillating around pi and stabilize actually in upward position but uh, okay let me go back to the simple stuff so we see that if we increase the energy the behavior will considerably change because compared to the regular harmonic oscillator actually it can exceed the maximum of potential energy and then it can show completely different trajectories if we recall uh, the swing in the playground once again we will uh, recall that it can actually go full round if you just hit it too hard and if there is not enough friction and not a lot of friction it will go full rounds again and again this is exactly the case when you go with your energy higher than the maximum potential energy so the energy as we know should be conserved this is how it looks this is the kinetic energy and this is the potential energy that i have used already on the previous slide so if we try to plot the so-called phase portrait of the system would look like this let me explain to you what is plotted here so here we have our variable phi i will change to mouse again because the pointer is not working how do i change to the mouse okay so here we have a coordinate and here we have velocity so if we are oscillating at this energy this is the case of harmonic oscillations our system will go around and if you increase the energy you will go starting from a circle more to elliptical even more to some 
skewed trajectories, as you can see here. And when you reach the top of your potential, you follow the red line. So what it means, if you exceed the maximum, you will go by this line, which is outside the red separatrix. So what it means in terms of our variables is that when the pendulum rotates, uh, swings back and forth, our coordinates oscillate. It can be strictly sinusoidal if the angle is smaller than 50 de 15 degrees. If you go to higher amplitudes, it becomes less harmonic. As you can see, it is a bit tilted here. But if you go above the maximum energy, your angle actually starts to grow. And this is called the running angle or running phase. Good. So let's uh, compare what happens to the system when, as I already advertised, the upper point starts to oscillate. When the upper point starts to oscillate, we get an extra circle around this pi, which is an unstable equilibrium, and then the system can actually stabilize here. Unfortunately, I don't have a slide devoted to that, but I have a video which I can show you later after I finish with the main part. Okay, so let's look again at the face portraits. When there is no damping, it is basically the same figure is here, you can see. So we can go in circular orbits around and around and around. And if the energy is too high, we will have a running angle following these uh, lines. But if we add friction, if we add uh, whatever, uh, some air which restricts the motion of your pendulum, then you will get uh, some kind of different trajectories, which means that he, they will become fo foci. So you have, an, instead of this kind of center, you have a focus. So at any initial condition, you will actually fall down to the center. Wherever you start, you will fall down to the center. And this happens because of uh, the dumping. So in the case of our swinging pendulum, we will, it will just stabilize downwards. In the case when we have Kapitza pendulum, it will stabilize actually upwards. Maybe I should simply show you this video. Let me show you here. Okay, sorry for... I assume you don't hear my sound, yes? No. Just a moment. What I need to do is I need to restart the demonstration. Okay. So this is the device which will make the, the suspension point oscillate. Now the pendulum is normal, a simple pendulum, which stabilizes in the direction downwards. And if you the suspension point off to it, you can see that it actually stabilizes in the direction upwards. slow motion. Here you see the oscillating fixed point and you see the uh, guy who is holding the device trying to move the pendulum away from this upper position and it is stabilizing upwards. Okay, so I go back to my presentation. Okay, so Let's come back to a more simple stuff maybe. So this is what we described in a, in a mechanical system, but as I already said, you can actually have it in any other branch of physics. So for example, if we are talking about waves, waves such as ripples on a lake or sound waves which travel through the air, they have again 
period which is equal to inverse frequency. So it is again described by the same oscillatory equation, which I can actually show here. You can see here for a pendulum, it is square root, as I showed before, g over l. For any other system, you will have a frequency defined by something else, but the equation will stay the same. And this is what makes it all like a pendular universe, as I called it. Okay, the burning candles, if you put two candles next to each other, they will behave, and you, the, the, and you observe the height of the flame, they will behave exactly as coupled Huygens clocks, which will hang, uh, the, the pendulum clock, which hang on a wall, and then they syn synchronize. So if you want, if you are willing to make this experiment, we can actually even do it now, maybe, uh, take two candles, start to burn the flame, and if they are set on one table, you will see that the flames can go anti-phase or in-phase or even stop uh, burning. It would be called the death of oscillations. Then the earthquakes, uh, what happens during an earthquake? The motion of tectonic plates on Earth during an earthquake is another example, actually, of oscillatory motion because the plates start to move back and forth together with its central position. And uh, again, this would be described uh, by a pendulum equation. And if we look at planetary motion, we know that the planets move around sun with a good approximation on uh, elliptical orbits. And elliptical orbits, if you parameterize them, some parameter will give, give again you a sign and cosine laws for the two coordinates, because uh, we have then two coordinates instead of one. So it is again uh, the example of harmonic oscillations. Yeah? So when we call, uh, talk about electronic oscillators, for example, electronic oscillators uh, generate uh, uh, oscillating signal using some circuitry, which Gary was uh, telling us about in his talk previous time, because uh, there is a great variety he was showing us of these electronic oscillators, the factors that determine the period in this electronics would be the design of a circuit. It could depend on resistance or capacitance or whatever other characteristic of a circuit. If we talk about alternating current in our power socket, uh, if you actually measure the current against time, you will get uh, again see the sinusoidal. Yes, the cellular processes in biology are also periodic and they can be described by the same pendulum question. Josephson's junction is uh, describing, of, describing the phase of a wave function of quantum particles in a superconductor. And again, they can have the same regimes as I was showing here with this running phase and oscillatory phase. Basically, this plot I have taken uh, from a junction kind of work. Okay, and, uh, and periodic potentials, of course, any motion will be described by the same thing. So uh, to finalize, I want to say that actually, wherever you look, in, in whichever uh, field of science, be it quantum mechanics, uh, sound waves, ocean, uh, even I would say weather, prediction of weather would make you find uh, actually, I think there is also, if you try to simulate the drum, motion of a drum, when you hit it in a musical instrument, you will find the same equation and it will have the same regimes as here. Basically, this uh, figure could be plotted for a pendulum, it can be plotted for electric circuit, it can be plotted for Josephson junction, it will be the same for all these systems which are described by the same equation. And to finish uh, this talk, uh, I would like to show you a video which was shot by myself in a museum where I went with my son last year, maybe. And uh, this is to show you that uh, such a simple thing uh, like a bob on a string can provide such beautiful effects because all you need is to know that the period of the motion of each of these balls is proportional to square root of the length. And then you can imagine a lot of beautiful things uh, going on with it. And uh, with this, I would uh, like to stop maybe talking and encourage your questions.
Okay, thank you very much, Janina. It was very interesting. A bit short, right? Everybody would have uh, wanted more, especially from the uh, <laughs> this capita pendulum. But I see that it was feature after all, right? We were saying that it won't, would not make an appearance, but it did. So please, everybody, ask your questions. We have a couple of them already, and we are uh, going to them. But before we look at the questions, I'd like to use my privilege as the chair of this section to um, comment on something that interested me very much. It was a piece of dialogue between Einstein and Dirac. And Einstein was saying to Dirac, I believe it was at the time he was working on this Kaluza Klein solution, he was telling him it would be enough, you know, if we would understand the electron. And then Dirac made this strange reply. He said, well, actually, that would be enough if students would understand the oscillator, the harmonic oscillator, the pendulum. How do you understand this reply from Dirac? I'm surprised that he involves students, and then he, of course, he puts the, uh, the pendulum at the center of it. So I believe uh, it's not quite clear uh, how to understand this reply. If it's a joke, if it's very uh, deep. Okay, so let, let me try to see if I understood correctly. So he asked if he would understand how to describe an electron. And the answer was, if he can understand how to describe a harmonic oscillator. So Einstein and was saying, if we, if we, so we, I, in my understanding of the anecdote, we, it means us, the, the scientists, the researchers, us, Einstein, Dirac, and the rest of the company. But Dirac replied, it would be enough if students, students would understand the harmonic oscillator. So I don't know if it's such a deep joke that, makes a very deep statement on the nature of reality from the point of view of these genius pioneers of understanding the universe or if he, if he was just having a go at the students saying that they don't understand anything and maybe we shouldn't be so um so uh, exigent i would not be able to connect the dancing <laughs> let's turn to the question we have from the audience so okay what are some examples of pendulum System in quantum physics from some anonymous attendee. I didn't know we have such a thing as anonymous okay. attendee. So let's go back here. In quantum physics, uh, well, the last two lines in this uh, second column is from quantum physics. Actually, if we go back to these uh, plots here, which maybe are very simple, we see that actually this plot is taken, uh, is plotted by me in some previous years. Here we have the phi. And here we have the rho, not the phi dot compared to this picture, yes? So this is taken actually from a quantum system where rho is the density of, uh, let's say it is a model of, uh, modulus of a complex number and phi is a phase of a complex number. And we know that the wave function of a particle is a complex function. So it has also, it has a modulus, the square root of density and it has a phase. So if we put our uh, quantum system in a situation where it would have this kind of energy landscape, it will behave in the same way if you solve the Schrodinger equation and if you substitute your wave function with the square root of density times exponent in, uh, with a phase factor, you will see that in time it behaves exactly like a pendulum and then your phase would be developing like this or like this, depending on the energy, depending on where you find yourself on this phase portrait. And this happens in uh, superconductors. It happens in the Josephson junctions when you have the contact of two different um, species, two different materials, or if you have a quantum well with two minima and they can tunnel so this tunneling between the two minima will actually, the disbalance of quantum particles in the two minima of the potential will be described by the pendulum equation. Thank you. Um, we have not a question, but a comment. So please ask questions. It's very interesting to have the opportunity to have a renowned scientist tell you about simple things, right? So uh, please ask. So we've got a comment from Douglas Blundell. He says, uh, the simple theory is of course correct only for small amplitudes. It is easy to show that the period increases if the amplitude is appreciable in proportion to the square of that amplitude. So that's a comment, but maybe you want to... Uh, yes, I can comment on the comment, of course. So uh, indeed, this is very correct. 
So the correct equation, even without dumping, is like this uh, on top here. If you want to find, the, if you want to have the uh, harmonic behavior to have a sine function, strictly sine function, then you have to replace this sine of phi here with phi, which of course is uh, correct only for small phi, for phi less than 15 or 20 degrees. But if we increase phi, increase amplitude, as you said, we go higher and higher here. And you see that from a circle, if we were, if we had the harmonic motion, we would have a circle. From a circle, it starts to elongate, be more like elliptical, and then it comes even like a squeezed ellipse. So indeed, this is correct. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Douglas. I'm not sure it's that easy to show that, right? And uh, in fact, the, the growth of the amplitude is not proportional. I mean, that's an approximation. The, the solutions, I believe, are quite complicated, elliptical integrals or things like this. Then we've got um, Amir Ramani, but he, he forgot to send the question. So we have to wait for the question of Amir. Uh, we have one from Anton Malitov, who is asking, why were Wigan's clock synchronized in antiphase rather than in phase? Okay. In fact, there was a study later, and maybe even um, very recently, like uh, 10 or 8 years ago, it was published, I think, in scientific reports, I can send you a reference, where they actually studied uh, the different initial conditions, which is like if we, the, basically, we can even uh, reproduce it if we take, uh, like, for example, uh, I don't know if you see anything here. Yeah? So if we have a uh, same uh, wooden rod and then which we hang, uh, do you see me? Because I don't see myself. If you hang two pendula here, yes, so you can hang them on different position from each other, yeah? And in fact, the signals that they send to each other, of course, depend on the distance between the two suspension points. Do you see what I mean? So if it is closer, it will be faster coming, the signals. <laughs> if it is uh, further away, it will be slower. And uh, in this work that I mentioned, uh, we have very recent work which reproduced Hogan's clocks. Uh, they found out that there can be different um, realizations. So depending on the distance, it can be uh, in antiphase, in phase, or death oscillation, death. So Huggins was just in the position when he was ill and lying in bed, looking at the wall, he didn't really change the relative position of the clocks. But if you do, you will get very different regimes. Right. In the case of Huggins, this is some type of form of dissipative coupling, right? Well, they, in that times, they didn't think all about dissipation at all. I mean, if they, if you take into account that they measured time by their own heartbeat, I think it is incredible that they actually found out such general laws. Yes, actually, that's another thing that uh, Douglas could have commented, that uh, also the orbit of Galileo was certainly a big approximation, depending on the state of excitement. So, Amir, uh, we didn't receive your question yet. And Mikhail Portnoy has a question, but he would like to ask himself. So, yes, indeed, please, uh, Sharon, if you can. Uh, allow Mikhail to ask the question. You also put it in the chat, but I'm sure it would be much more interesting to, to hear him ask the question. Um, hello, Nina, Fabrice, and everyone else who I cannot see. Nina, um, uh, you are clearly very much interested in this pendulum stuff. But uh, I know, and Fabrice introduced it as a student of Lazavik, who is kind of optics. Uh, what uh, actually attracted your, uh, you to the subject and how is it related to your research? The pendulum. Do okay. you... Hi, Misha. Thank you for the question. Uh, the fact is that when I started to solve my Schrodinger equations so with my quantum wave function, and I was analyzing in some system. Um, actually, if we talk about what I am working on, I'm working on polaritons, which are uh, like a hybrid system, as you know, of photons and excitons, and they transform into each other. Yeah. 
so they breathe if you want to see the uh, it will be again an oscillatory motion if you want to measure what comes out of the system you will see of course uh, without dumping a sinusoidal uh, intensity coming out so even before realizing that it is also much connected I was working with an oscillating system, which is intrinsically oscillating. There are internal oscillations. So when I wrote down the equations and I started to mathematically study them, then I started to also plot these phase portraits. And as I said, these figures here are taken from a quantum mechanical paper. And then I realized like, oh, wow, it is all uh, so much the same and similar to this mechanical, simple thing that everyone studies at school, basically. So this is how I came here. And then I started to also dig into that. Thank you. OK, then Manas Pande is asking, as light also behaves like a wave, what are some pendular motions related to optics? Mm -hmm. Well, in the sense, uh, if you say that the light is an oscillating wave, of course, you can just describe uh, the intensity of the field, uh, like the electric field in the light wave in the, will be uh, oscillating as a cosine function if you measure it. And the cosine function is a solution of the harmonic oscillation equation. Basically, I think I didn't do it myself by hand. I think if we write down the Maxwell equations uh, and uh, the electromagnetic wave is a solution of the Maxwell equations, and we know that the Maxwell equation is a differential equation, I think that we will find what we will find is a wave equation. And then we can uh, even compare it maybe to the mechanical system equation. So mathematically, I think we can find uh, the equations describing E, the electric field is oscillating harmonically. Yes, indeed. Uh, the, the creation and addition operator of second quantization, they are harmonic oscillator, right? So Yeah, that's happens. true. But I mean, uh, I think the question was not about the quantum uh, nature of light. It was starting with waves, indeed, yes, yes. Yeah, that, that's an interesting question, actually. Would we find the harmonic motion without introducing the, the... I don't know, maybe you can find it still from Maxwell equations. Maybe not. Then Camilo Lopez is uh, asking, how do you understand the running phase? Is it possible to distinguish, say, a free pi phase from a pi phase? Is the running phase a signature of quantum behavior? Thank you very much for the question. Answer is no, it's not a signature of quantum behavior. Imagine that you are doing the exercise in the, like when you need to hang yourself, yes, on a rod, and then uh, I don't know the English word, what you do. And if you start to swing, and actually you can just imagine a swing. If you hit, if you, your initial velocity is too high, then you can go full round. And if you go full round, uh, here again, I will try to use a pointer on the slide. Mm. Okay, if we go full round here, this will be exactly the running phase, yes? So it will be a running angle, not a running phase. So if you want to distinguish between pi and three pi, it will be, you will need to count how many turns you made. That's it. Mathematically, of course, you can't distinguish. You need to look at your swinging pendulum and just count one, two, three, and uh, yeah. But it's not quantum mechanical, it's classical. Then Gary Sinclair, uh, to whom you referred previously, is asking, so our previous speaker from last lecture is asking, can you always or only sometimes map the dynamics of a two-level quantum system onto that of a quantum oscillator? Mm, I think that uh, to get the equations like this, like a simple pendulum, of course, uh, you can only in a linear regime, because if you have a lot of particles which interact with each other, you will have some extra terms in these equations which add nonlinearity or some energy shifts, detunings, and so on. And what happens then? And if you look at these already sophisticated uh, patterns on the phase portraits, if you add nonlinearities, 
they will get shifted all these uh, uh, fixed points will be shifted and skewed somehow and you can even jump from one to the other so in a uh, in a general case in the quantum system you have to add more terms and the equation gets more complicated and you can have more regimes like jumping between different equilibrium points but in a very simple cases when there is no dumping no interaction they will get the same equation i don't know if it's answer section these look like trick questions actually misha portnoy has another question and misha you have the privilege to unmute yourself so please if you want to ask your question directly okay if not i can read the question no no i i they have unmuted me finally but it was not momentarily so uh, um, it is about uh, that beautiful experiment on Capizzo pendulum which you showed in the movie mm -hmm. uh, it's very counterintuitive uh, when something is shaking around um, the point which is up rather than down mm -hmm. so the question is if i shake uh, so everything is unusual it does not go to minimum of potential energy so if i have for example two particles two electrons and I uh, shake the system. I can imagine uh, with, with the sound or light, uh, will I be able to turn uh, repulsion between particles into attraction? Does anyone do it, something like that? Okay, it's a tricky question to which the answer is probably I don't know, but I will comment on what you said because you said that it does not stabilizing the minimum of the potential energy this is not so the thing is that if you uh, add the oscillation of the suspension point then you get some extra dependence here you ex you add kind of extra gravity because if you add uh, acceleration in the vertical direction you kind of adding extra gravity extra acceleration to g yes and this extra gravity starts to be time dependent so if you look at the plot of the potential energy here it will start having some local minima in the around pi so this is why it oscillates and stabilizes upwards because potential energy actually has a minimum there it is a smaller local minimum so yes, if, you, if you make your amplitude too far away from pi it will fall down but if you are in some range of angles it will go up so this is a comment and about two particles interacting i can't say because i think it is more complicated than that if you have two body wave function if we are talking about quantum mechanics uh, clearly there are ways to turn uh, repulsion to attraction by tuning some external field but i don't think it is uh, connected to this example so my answer is to, to the whole question my answer is i don't know actually wise answer then we have alex wood who is asking the pendulum clocks are outdated are there any modern mechanical technologies that use pendulums i think actually uh, of course nowadays we have quartz clocks and atomic clocks but if you look at uh, the the big band tower in london or in Kremlin, which I was showing in my, one of my slides, I think they still work on pendulums until now, and they are quite efficient. I think that uh, maybe their discrepancy is some 15 seconds per day or so, so they are quite good. So where the question, but the question was not that. The question was where we actually use pendulums. Actually, I did uh, talk about that, yes, a little bit I mentioned. So here, um ballistic pendulum is regularly used to measure the velocity of a ballet in police metronomes are used by musicians to uh, get the correct rhythm in their music because this is uh, quite accurate they don't need atomic clocks to count the rhythm in a, in a piece which would be 10 or 20 minutes long when they play so metronomes are used everywhere in the musical uh, industry to say 
Otherwise, uh, I may think, but I think it is used uh, in many, many regards. I think even some of the clocks which our fathers are wearing, they are still have this um, spring, how is it called? The spiral springs, which are basically a pendulum mechanism. Right, and the swings in the playground, right? They are uh, essential. Yeah, swing, but it is not using as a technology. Swimming, swinging in the playground, of course. Yeah, go say that to my daughter. And then we've got the final question uh, that will be asked as well directly by Amir Ramani. So if we can unmute Amir, please. I think Hello. Amir is even more an expert than me on all these face portraits, oh. isn't it? Hi, Amir. Hi. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Nina. I really enjoy. Uh, well, uh, I sent I, I sent just my question, but let me ask it directly. It's better, uh, you know, from our experience. I, hearing. I don't hear. Other cases. You hear me? Unfortunately, I uh, yeah, didn't yeah, hear yeah. you after a few moments. Okay, Maybe now, now you hear me? me? Okay, okay. Yeah, my, my question is that if you hear me, uh, you see oscillation in other cases. I mean, in focal pendulum or I don't know, in bullying or in other cases that you uh, described. Do we need such a strong coupling regime or not? I mean, I said in the beginning of my, in the uh, beginning that uh, in, from our experience in polariton excitons, okay, we have a kind of a strong coupling regime to see this. I want to see that it is that fundamental to have such a strong coupling regime to see oscillations in other, in other systems or not. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it seems to me that, for example, when we have a ball and uh, a ball hanging from, for example, a point, there is a kind of a strong coupling between, for example, the points uh, on the, for example, uh, in the space and the ball, such a thing. I mean, I, I, I hope you, uh, you. Mm, okay. I will try to answer. I think that that it, um, I think that uh, when we have a simple pendulum, we don't have any kind of strong coupling because we have one oscillator only, and it is described by this harmonic oscillation equation. Whereas when we have coupled oscillators coupled oscillators, for example, exciton polaritons, or we can have two masses attached on the same like springs from different sides, then they have, uh, okay, so when we have one body or one system of particles and it can be described by oscillatory motion, it is not coupled to anything, but if we have two coupled oscillators, then the relative behavior of the two will be in turn uh, described by the harmonic oscillations or just the pendulum equation. So these are different steps, I would say. You can have this equation without any coupling, and then you can add coupling and have it on top of each other, and you can even have the double pendulum if you want a mechanical example where this thing oscillates and then this thing oscillates, and then, of course, you get more sophisticated patterns. But I'm not sure it answers your question. I think you don't need, my answer is, I think you don't need strong coupling to have harmonic oscillation equation. Okay, thank you, Nina. And then we've got two questions that appeared, and I don't want, of course, to leave people uh, worrying or uh, wondering. So we've got one question from Muhammad Iqbal, and he's asking, uh, does the heavier weight cause a larger angle of oscillation in the pendulum? Is that an exam type of question? No. Uh, if we go to example of, of Galileo, Galilei, and uh, if we don't change much the 
if the amplitude is kept small here, I mean, the, the question was, does the weight affect the amplitude? The weight. The, the weight. The uh, mass. But, uh, yeah, 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 the mass. But the thing is that the amplitude depends only on the initial conditions. If we start from here, the amplitude is larger than if we start from here. So I wouldn't say, of course, if we have, if we have um, friction, it can, all, it can be different for different kinds of bodies. But amplitude shouldn't be dependent on weight because amplitude depends on initial conditions only. And then this would be probably the last question. Gary Sinclair is asking, um, so the, he says it's a command, but it's actually a question. Do they use mechanical pendula in dynamic Casimir force measurements? I don't know, but actually I know, I checked recently when I was preparing for this talk that they use pendula to measure something about quantum gravity. I had a soy paper of 2020 actually about Casimir effect. I don't know, unfortunately, if you can say, I will be very interested. But I think they use pendula even now for very sophisticated things. Okay, thank you very much, Nina. I hope that this answers all questions. So you see, the simpler the topic, the more, more difficult are the questions, right? Not surprisingly. But you also said that I should have shown the more complicated things with the Kapitza pendulum. Well, we, we, we saw quite a lot of the, of the Kapitza pendulum after all. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It was really my pleasure. I enjoyed it a lot. And it was ours to, uh, to listen to you. So our next IOP lecture will be uh, in March, 17th of March, and it will be on the Eratosthene experiment. So also something very fundamental. And then there will be surprises because the guest himself uh, will be kind of, uh, of a surprise by itself. Thank you very much, Nina. Thanks everybody for joining us and for asking questions. And uh, hopefully everybody learned something. I did myself learn quite a lot. Thanks, Nina. And goodbye. Thank you very much, Fabrice.